Oh goodness. First Formula One race I ever saw live was, yeah, it was 1995 at Silverstone. Um, and I remember it clear as day, uh, just because it was, it was terrifying and it was thrilling. Um, the speed and the noise and the smell. Um, I remember the first time the Ferrari came past and it still had the V12 in the back and it, and it just sounded like, like a Valkyrie, you know, it sounded like something otherworldly and it, it sent a shiver up, up your spine. It was the most electrifying sound I'd ever heard. And it gave me that impression of, it sounds silly, but sort of heroicism of the, of the drivers, because here was this, this thing that was shrieking and was terrifying. And all of a sudden the color and the noise is re it's really real. It's right in front of you. And as a kid, it's actually quite scary. And then you realize that in the midst of, of, of this insanity is a, a person controlling it and um, you know, taking the tiger out for a ride. Um, they were controlling this terrifying thing and it blew me away. And that's, I knew before I went to see Formula One in the flesh for the first time, what I wanted to do with my life. But it was only seeing it for real that I, I think I truly appreciated how incredible these guys were at, at what they were doing. Um, and I was 13 when Ayrton Senna was killed. And he was my, absolutely my idol. Um, and it was the first time I'd really experienced death in that way, uh, being at an age where you understand what it means. I'd lost grandparents before. But had been, you know, so young. I didn't go to their funerals or anything like that, and I don't think I really fully comprehended death. Um, and Senna was a weird one because he always seemed immortal to me. And so I was thirteen years old. You're just you, you, you're, you're maturing. You're getting to that part of your age where you understand those things. And he died, and it really knocked me off. And and my friends didn't get it because they like football, and footballers didn't drop down dead. But, but I just lost this guy that, that I idolized. And that week, my dad bought me my first copy of Autosport and Motoring News. And I read, you know, David Tremaine and Nigel Roebuck and guys like that. And as a 13 year old whose mates didn't really understand what was going on, their words spoke to me and made me realize it was okay to, to feel that way. And that these grown men felt the same way too. And that made me realize what I wanted to do with my life was to make that geeky, nerdy 13 year old whose mates didn't really understand him, make him feel that it was cool to like this thing that other people maybe didn't like. And I knew then from age 13, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write about this thing that I loved so that other people could love it too. Um, so yeah, I, I dedicated myself to becoming an F1 journalist, not just a journalist, not just a sports journalist, an F1 journalist, which my parents were very, well, they were great. They were just, you know, they backed me all the way, but I think they were also terrified that I had decided upon a path that was so niche and the chances of succeeding in it were so slim. They were definitely worried, but they backed me all the way. My cousin was uh, one of the political editors, one of the leader writers at the Times. They got me work experience at the Times which was a real eye opener. And um, he, he said to me, don't study journalism. If you study journalism, you will graduate as an identical journalist, to everybody on your course, there will be no individuality to your writing, you won't have your own style, just don't do it, it's not worth it. Media studies at the time was a bit of a joke degree. Um, you didn't really go and do that. He said, go and do politics. I loved politics anyway, always have, but he said, you know, study politics, it will teach you to write, to research, to form your own conclusions. All the skills you need for being a journalist, but you'll maintain an element of individuality through it. So I did. Went to university studying politics and I wrote my thesis on the politics of Formula One, which my lecturers hated because they wanted it to be on like European fiscal policy or something. Um, and uh, yeah, gave me a dreadful, I mean, it almost failed me out of my course. Um, but I just clung on uh, and managed to pass with a second class degree. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter. Used to hang in my toilet, which was about where it deserved to be. <laughs> I 
Um, but through that, through the researching of it, I'd gone to an auto sports show and there was a, a booth at the back for the new F1 magazine. And there sitting on this booth was this guy who had inspired me to want to be a journalist in the first place. It was David Tremaine. And I went up to him and I said, hi, my name's Will. I, I want to be a Formula One journalist. And he was like, okay. And he gave me his number and he gave me his email and said, send me a thousand words on anything. So I did. He liked it. He said, it's a bit rough around the edges, but let's stay in touch. And when I decided on that thesis, he helped me and he put me in touch with Joe Sayward, who, you know, knows all the ins and outs of the politics. My thesis had to be 12,000 words. Joe sent me 14,000 words on the politics of F1. Um, and I still managed to write a crap thesis. <laughs> um, uh, but crucially, I left university with this terrible thesis. And a couple of months later, I'm working in a bar and I get a phone call and it's, David, Will, we need some help writing the end of season Formula One annual. Do you want to come in and do a bit of work with us? So yeah, cool. So I went, I did two weeks work experience with them putting together the news review for the annual. And on the last day, I turned up at the office with a pillow and a sleeping bag. And DT said, what's that for? And I said, oh, I'm not leaving. And he said, don't worry, we weren't going to ask you to. We want you to stay. And that's where it started. That was my first job in Formula One. It was amazing to be a part of it, to be a part of the official Formula One magazine. Um, and we had this little rivalry going on with F1 racing and the Haymarket, uh, which, was, which was really positive. Um, but it, 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 it suddenly got very big and then imploded very quickly within about the space of a year. Um, the decision was taken to really invest in the magazine. New editor was brought in, Matt Franey, who I learned a huge amount under. Um, but it was suddenly big photo shoots, lots of money being spent. It went from being quite a big format magazine to a smaller format magazine. I think F1 Racing started to get a bit worried at that point because we started to be a lot more serious. The sales figures picked up massively. But with that, obviously Bernie running F1 wanted total control over every aspect of it. And then it started to become, well, the covers need to look the way that Bernie wants them to, or the, the content of the magazine needs to be a certain way. And Matt Franey sort of turned around and said, well, this, this isn't what I was brought on board to do. And he left. And we then got a very quick succession of different editors up to the point at which I think about a week before the 2004 season started, um, the lawyers came in and said, we're really sorry, but Bernie's decided that he's pulling the plug. Uh, the issue that goes out on Thursday will be the last issue of the magazine. Um, that's it. Thanks very much and see you later. And I was 23. I'd just lost my dream job and I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, a week before the start of the season, I was, and, and I think a week before my 23rd birthday, I was lost. Just, I'd lost everything um, and it was heartbreaking. And I went home and I spoke to my parents. I said, what do I do? And they said, well, you haven't come this far to just let it go. What do you need to do? I said, I, just, I need to be at the races. I need to go to the races. And they lent me a bit of money um, and I bought a camper van. I bought an old Volkswagen uh, camper and I phoned Richard Woods, who was the head of the FAA press at the time, and I said, Richard, what do I need to do? He said, get an outlet. I don't care what it is, find an outlet and I'll get you a pass. So I went to Metro newspaper in London, which was a free newspaper. And at the time, your credentials, you could only get credentials if it was an actual uh, a publication that people bought. So the notion of a free paper was something that hadn't really been done before. But then when I showed them how many copies were printed and what the pass on readership was because obviously people pick it up for free it gets left on the underground or whatever and someone else picks it up and reads it they were like wow this is you know, this is millions of people and they said yeah great have your pass so i let i jumped in a camper van and i drove around europe for eight months um reporting for the metro newspaper and uh i i never thought my career would go on beyond the end of that year 
So I was determined just to have fun. And I had a bloody good time. Um, if you can imagine staying in the campsites with the fans at every race and then getting up in the morning, sometimes a little bit fuzzy, um, and going to work and do your dream job and walk into the paddock and do this, this thing. And, you know, every day I'd go back to the campsites and I would have always gone to the teams and the teams would have given me some merchandise. So everyone I was staying, all these fans I was staying with, I was like, you know, bring them back a cap from their favorite driver or whatever. And it was lovely. It was really lovely. But it, it, it reminded me of why I wanted to get into it in the first place. And it reminded me that your job or my job as I saw it was to bring those guys that I was camping with in with me. You know, I got out at the end of every day and, and all they wanted... What, you know, what happens at this point and, and what's going on here and what's this person really like? And I realized that's, that was part of my job was to make it real. And it really affected, I think, everything I've done since then because that's, that's what I see my, my role as being, is, is, is to make it real for people, to bring them on this mad journey and this brilliant thing that we all love and make it real for them and bring them along and make them a part of it. Um, and that's what that year taught me massively. Um, I, th I, I, don't, I don't think I made myself very popular. Uh, I was 23 years old. I don't think I took it as seriously as I should have done. Um, and I think I, I've always been a little bit, a little bit much every now and then. And honestly, me now, nearly 40, if the me, 23 years old, turned up in Formula One, I'd hate him. But, but it wasn't that I didn't take it seriously. It's that I was just having f such a great time. And I genuinely thought it was all going to be over. At the end of the day, I never thought I would get another job. I thought, I thought this was it. So I might as well enjoy it. And then um, August, I got a phone call from Stéphane Sanson, who had worked for F1 Racing magazine and had been picked up to be the director of communications for GP2, which was replacing Formula 3000. And I always loved hanging out in the Formula 3000 paddock with all of the guys who were trying to be F1 drivers. Similar position to me in that they all realized that they either made it to Formula 1 at the end of the year or it was pretty much over for them. And Stéphane said, I see what you're doing in the camper van. And we love it. Um, it's really rock and roll and it's everything that we're about. Do you want to be our press officer? And at the time I had, you know, I had nothing. I, I was struggling to feed myself. Didn't, I genuinely didn't have enough money to feed myself and pay for petrol for the camper van. It was one thing or the other. Um, and only out of the kindness of other journalists did I manage to either eat and drive or do, you know, do the two. And so I jumped at it. I said, yeah, 100%. Um, I wrote my first press release for them after the very first test of the very first car that August. And by Christmas, I was living in Switzerland um, as press officer for GP2. Flavio ran the whole thing. We worked out of his offices in Geneva. And then Bernie was obviously over the top of, of that, the Bridgestone tyres. You had huge partners involved with it. And it was, you know, it was almost too big to fail. But then we got to the first race weekend and in the first practice session, I think 16 cars, 12 or 16 cars broke down. There was an issue with the wiring loom. And then in qualifying more of the same brakes going, um, the first race, the pole sitter's engine blew as he left the pits. And we're sitting there just, you know, heads in our hands. What the hell are we going to do? You know, this is, it's an absolute disaster. Um, overnight, Brembo turned up with a truck full of brakes and parked outside the circuit and came in and said, we understand you've got some issues with your brakes because they knew that we were marginal. And so between Saturday and Sunday, we changed brake supplier to Brembo and never had a brake problem again. So that was great. And actually, where GP2 was born was... There was a F1 qualifying changed halfway through the year at the German round at the Nürburgring. There was a two part qualifying and one of the parts of qualifying was suddenly taken away and TV crews didn't have anything to put in that part of their timetable. 
And so they put GP2 in. And the race, as was, was the best race we'd had all year. The engine woes were gone. There was like a five, six way fight for the lead. It was incredible. And all of a sudden, these people who had tuned in to watch F1 qualifying, that were then getting something else, watched it and went, oh my God, this is awesome. And that's how GP2 suddenly became successful. Um, and it was just luck, total luck, that that race happened to be the first one that was televised around the world to an audience expecting to see something that they, they didn't. And from that point, it just got stronger and stronger and stronger. We had an amazing fight that first year between Kovalainen and Rosberg for the title, which was only concluded on the last weekend. The next season, we had PK and Hamilton, which was amazing. Um, you know, watching, watching Lewis grow, watching him develop, watching him become in front of your eyes, this guy who would go on to be an F1 world champion. And you, you saw him, he turned up at the start of the year, this you know, kid with a curly afro. Um, and by the end of it, actually by Hockenheim, he had been taken over by McLaren. I wasn't allowed to do any of his media time, I had to pass it all through McLaren. His head had been, you know, the buzz cut was then in. He was, you know, he was being molded as their future, as this F1 driver. Um, just to watch these, and it was, it, it still had those similarities to the F3000 of old. Some kids who knew they were never going to go any further. Others who were having their last real year of fun before the big time. And others who were trying to prove themselves before the big time. I remember the first time I met Lewis, it was at a test at Paul Ricard. Um, and he was still wearing his F3 overalls. It was a cold day. And um, he was just, just a normal kid, you know, there with his family. Uh, and it remained like that, you know, all the way through through every time I, I, I knew him. He's gone on an incredible journey, and I've you know I've been there to witness it all the way through, the high points and the low points. And I think um, the Lewis that exists now is so strong. He's always, I think, struggled to connect. Um, I don't know why. Um, maybe there's, he always sort of refers to self doubt and uh, being bullied as a kid. And um, I get that, you know, I, I, I struggled at school. I was, you know, I was a choir boy, you know, his voice hadn't dropped and took his teddy bear to boarding school with him. And yeah, you know, I had a, I had a rough time at school. And I know that you, you do, constantly question yourself after that point because it's kind of a it's a bit of a sort of a shitty foundation for for trying to gain any semblance of uh, a solid base to to build on for you you know as you're becoming a grown-up and starting to you know become an adult um and he's really wrestled with it and you, you saw him you know he wrestled with his family and then brought them back and relationships and life outside Formula One and, you know, trying to bring all of those facets of his life together. And he's had to do that in the public eye and struggle with that in the public eye. Whilst at the same time, maintaining performance at the highest possible level. He's the only driver in history that's won a race in every single season he's competed. No matter the machinery, no matter the difficulties put in front of him, that's astonishing. And even in seasons where he doesn't have anybody to compete with, he competes with himself and draws a level out of himself that you've never seen before. And people now question, is Lewis right to go away and have his fashion line and do this and do that and go off to LA all the time? And you're like, well, ultimately it's his choice. And if it's not affecting his racing, what does it matter? But there's a very normal, very shy, very humble, uh, and genuine human being that exists within Lewis. And I don't understand the grief that he gets. I don't understand the hate that he gets. I don't understand the people that just want bad things for him because he's, he's genuinely a good person. Um, and it's only maybe after he retires that people will look back and say, wow, he was phenomenal, wasn't he? Why they can't look at him now and say, he's phenomenal. It's a bit of a shame. It's a real shame because I don't think we're going to appreciate quite how good he is until he's no longer racing.
and then it'll be too late. Yeah, this is this. I think this is it. You have to have a level of introspection. If you if you look at yourself and believe that you're the best thing ever, then you're never going to improve. If you look at yourself and think you're terrible, well, then you shouldn't be doing it. You know, racing drivers have to believe they're the best. They have to believe that they're faster than anybody else. Otherwise, they should go away and do something else. But to believe you're the best and not then work at improving or to believe that there is no part of your armory that needs improving is insane. Um, and it's where Verstappen has changed. He came in and from a really young age was all about the whole, I don't need to change. You know, I've driven in a certain way and that's what's got me here. But last year after Monaco 2018, he realized, shit, I do have to change something here because this isn't working out for me. And since he made that connection and clip made the change, his form has been incredible. The last year, Max Verstappen has been on arguably as good, if not better form than, than Hamilton. He's, he's something else. And that came from that introspection, that introspection that has marked Lewis out as the best of his generation. That ability to consistently look inside and find something that needs working on. Even at a time when there's no, as we were talking about, there's no actual challenge to you on the track. You look inside yourself and find the parts of yourself that you can improve, that you can better. And in so doing, make yourself even even better. It's, it's yeah, that's, that's where the greats come from. Switching from being a journalist to being a, a press officer was really hard in the early stages. Um, I never had any training as a journalist. I never had any training as a press officer. And it's funny because they're, they're two sides of the same fence. They're both telling a story, but I guess the press officer's job is to give you the bones and the journalist's job is to put flesh on those bones. Um, but I remember the first time that I knew what the real situation was, but I had to write something in a way that didn't quite give away what, what had happened. It was a really bitter pill to swallow. And I, I, I really sort of kicked against it for a while and thought we should always tell the absolute truth about everything. Um, youth, naivety. Um, yeah, I don't think it... it, it it, it never really settled with me. If it had, I'd still be in PR. But I was too much of a, I think I was, I wanted to be too honest about everything all the time. And so it was, I loved it. I loved being a part. I think I loved it because I was a part of it more than I loved doing what I did. I became director of communications in the second year. So the responsibilities that came along with that, I think helped to cement, okay, we, you know, you do have to toe the party line and it, this is the way it is. But I always missed, I missed the journalism part. I missed the storytelling. I missed being able to tell everything and not just the bits that your boss wanted you to tell. It was, it's a formative, it was a formative time for everybody. Um, mechanics, engineers, drivers, journalists, everybody covering GP2 at that time was on that sort of upward trajectory in their careers. And I, and I think it was really important for me to be there and to do that as well. Um, it, it, it also formed relationships that have carried on throughout, be they good or bad. Um, Rosberg and I had a, a really difficult relationship from the outset. Uh, kind of a, I wouldn't say love hate, but it was it, it was a bit awkward from from the get go because I didn't get his sense of humour, I didn't really get his personality, and it took me ages. It took me actually until he'd left the, the championship, and I went back to Formula One later for me to kind of really get him, and I think for him to get me as well. Um, but like with Lewis, or I think really with anybody from that generation, you were a part of something that was really special and it did tie you together and it gave you a bond and it gave you when you then met them later on in formula one they knew that you weren't some johnny come lately who was only interested in them because they were an f1 driver you'd been there and you'd followed them throughout 
you know, you you follow them from the F3 paddock to the, or, you know, as it became the GP3 paddock to the GP2 paddock to Formula One. Um, and actually, when I ended up doing TV and being in the TV pen, it was really interesting and it, it started to hit home how much in their first weekend, the guys who'd graduated up from GP2 to F1 would very often come straight to me as their first interviewer because it was a face they knew and that was lovely it was nice to think maybe there was a an element of trust there but also that you know there was a familiar face i did three years with gp2 and i and i and i loved it um but the the sort of the, the hunger in me to go back to writing was always there and i was offered the opportunity to become editor of a new virtual magazine um called GP Week, uh, run by Keith Sutton, who I'd known for many years, um, you know, obviously as, as one of the foremost photographers in Formula One. And so he took me on and I, and I became editor of that. And uh, we covered Formula One, GP2, Formula Three, MotoGP, Rally. It was a huge amount of work. Uh, every week, every Monday morning, this 100 plus page virtual e-magazine went up and it was in the early days of the ipad and e-readers and it was really successful um i remember when we you know we had our like our millionth reader or something and it was that was a really big thing back then um we broke a couple of stories which was great um for for a really new really young uh, outlet i was really proud of it really really proud of it and it got me back into the F1 paddock again, and using those relationships that I'd found. I think in that time I learned I wasn't a great journalist. And I can admit I, I was not, I'm not a news hound. I'm not a John Noble. I'm not a Michael Schmidt. You know, I'm not, I'm not a news hound. I don't have that, that ability um, to sniff out a good news story, follow it through and get it absolutely nailed on. What I loved more than anything was being a storyteller. Finding the finding the things that nobody else knew about or painting them in a way that would get people excited about the sport or about the drivers or about the teams or that's where I that's where I think I excelled and it's where I found my my greatest happiness and i was at the chinese grand prix um and gp2 asia series was running at that point and it ran on the same weekends as the speed car championship which was like a nascar style thing for xf1 drivers and they had been providing world feed commentary for gp2 asia and it just so happened that this weekend there was no there was no speed car so they had no commentary for the GP2 Asia race and I got a phone call a frantic phone call from F1 back so Bernie's lot again uh, over at FOM Will can you come and see us I was like yeah okay cool so I went down to the the, the broadcast center sat down and said you know about GP2 right and I was like yeah you know I used to be the press officer they were like okay cool reckon you can do some commentary I was like um I'm, 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 I'll give it a go. And so I, uh, yeah, picked up the microphone. I did practice. That went okay. They asked me to do qualifying, did qualifying. They said, we want you to do the race, did the races. And then that was it. They asked me to come back and do another one. And then at the start of the next season, they asked me to do the full actual GP2 season. Um, and that was that. Uh, I was a commentator. Um, again, no training, just thrown in and go for it. I, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Into turn four, Grosjean around the outside of Max Chilton. Oh, Will he get around the outside of Gonzalez as well? He is, he's also around the outside of Gonzalez. Now the inside line for Grosjean. Oh, shut up. That's ridiculous. Three drivers in one and a half corners. Grosjean, I doth my cap to you, sir. That was epic stuff. Oh, that was just... Some people liked what I did. Some people thought I was way too opinionated. I probably was. 
Um, but I think because, because I'd spent so much time in that paddock and I knew all the guys and I knew all the teams, it was, it was all, I could never be anything but honest and, and, and real with it. So, I, you know, some people like the, the truthfulness of it. As I said, some people I think thought I was a, I was a bit too opinionated or a bit too close to it. Um, but I could never be anything but, but me and just be honest. And I loved it. I, 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 I properly, properly loved it. Um, the joy of, of commentary is something that is really difficult to find in any other uh, area of journalism, broadcasting, whatever. It's, it's the immediacy of it. It's the fact you will never, ever get it right. And that's the drug that keeps you coming back. And I loved it. I lo- I, there, were t- I was, I, I, there were times when I was on my knees screaming because it was so much fun. I remember I had a, in the end, I ended up with, with great co-commentators alongside me. And I remember 200th GP2 race, Davide Valsecchi literally jumping on my back. And he's, he's got his microphone and he's on my back and I'm kind of piggybacking around the, the broadcast center, just going nuts at this race. And it was, oh man, it was fun. It was so much fun. Um, what was interesting was I didn't know that they were listening to it in America. Um, and over at Speed Channel, they would take the, my world feed and they'd put their own commentary on top of it. But the producers there were listening to my feed coming in and said they'd be, be rolling around in hysterics at it and loved it and thought it was just honest and raw. And when their pit lane reporter, Peter Windsor, went to start the US F1 team, they suddenly had the need for a pit reporter. And they gave me a call and said, uh, we want to come. Uh, we want you to come out and have a meeting with us. So I flew to Charlotte, North Carolina, and went and had steak with uh, Frank Wilson and Dan Shudy at Speed Channel. And the next morning, I went in to the offices and I met Rick Miner, who was the boss at Speed Channel. And Rick was this, at the time he was, this larger than life guy, like gold rings on all his fingers and cigar on the go, Grateful Dead posters all over the office wall. Like in the middle of a motorsport channel, you'd expect there to be like Indy 500 stuff and you know, NASCAR, but like Grateful Dead posters everywhere. And um, there's smoke coming off this big cigar and Rick kind of sits in his chair and Frank's there and Dan's there and I'm there. And he goes, well, these guys didn't call to say you were an asshole, so I guess you got the fucking job. And I was like, this is going to be great. I can, I can work here. This is cool. And, and, and then again, is that, that next step, one thing led to another, led to another. And all of a sudden, I'm a pit lane reporter working for Fox at the Speed Channel. Um, and all of a sudden, I'm broadcasting to the United States of America about Formula One. It's, it's nuts. The worst thing you can do is go online and look at what people are saying about you. I did that first, God, the first week I was with Speed Channel, I stupidly Googled myself and there was a thread just titled, I hate Will Buxton. And I went to James Allen because James went through all of this with ITV. And I said, dude, how do I, how do I deal with this? And he said, just, just don't. Just listen to your producers, listen to the guys that employ you. And if they keep employing you and they tell you you're doing a good job, that is all you need to worry about. Just don't listen to the negativity because there will always be negativity. Just do what you do. And that was a really great piece of advice. Um, you know, sometimes people have tried to change me or what I've, what I've done and all I can do is be me. You know, some of those same kind of internet warriors that want to tell you that they, they hate what you do. They say that they think I'm, I'm disingenuous, that I'm putting it on. I couldn't put this on. I am like a kid in a sweet shop when I get into that paddock because it is, it's, it's all I ever wanted to do. And I love it as much now as I did when I first walked into the paddock. 
I still get that same buzz. I still get that same joy. I still, I still get the thrill, even though the, the, the drivers are young enough to be my kids now, I still see them as my heroes. They're still doing this amazing thing that I could never do. And I find it, I find it fascinating and, and wonderful. How could I not be excited about it? Um, I can't change who I am. I can't change what I do. Um, I remember when we started with NBC and I started working with Jason Swales and Jason has had one of the most profound effects on me as, uh, uh, well, from a professional and a personal capacity, actually, I don't think I would be the broadcaster or the man I am today without Jason being a part of my life for the last seven, God, is it seven, eight years? It's like a marriage without the arguments. But it was the first weekend we worked together. And, you know, camera rolling over. And I tried to do the, you know, hi, and, you know, welcome to Melbourne. And I tried to, I tried to be what I thought NBC would want me to be, which was polished and, you know, in the sports jacket and the, hi, I'm Ed Winchester sort of thing. And, um, and Chase just turned the camera off and he just said, what are you doing? Like, what, what are you doing? Who the hell was that? And I, I was just, you know, he's like, right, have you got a script in your head? And I said, yeah. He said, forget it. Just drop it out of your head right now. Just talk, okay? People aren't tuning in to see you have rehearsed something. Just talk, all right? And if you mumble over your words or you get lost or you forget, just be honest about it and say, oh, where did I go with that? Okay, right, bring it back. Just be real. Just be real. Just be you. And then he said a phrase which became our phrase and is our phrase for everything. He, go, he said, uh, don't polish the turd. If it, if it goes to shit, just let it be shit. And that's how we've done everything ever since for the last seven, eight years. Just be honest and just be raw. And, and I hope that in that way, it feels like you're just having a conversation with people at home because I don't script what I do. I don't, you know, I have an idea of what I want to say, but I don't plan it. Um, and we'll very rarely retake something, you know, if the, the camera goes slightly out of focus or misses where I've gone or whatever, we just, we just keep it going. And, and then there's that, that level of, of realness then, which again is about getting people off their couch and bringing them in and saying, come with me, come and look at this, you know? I think one of the things that we were really lucky with uh, at NBC was for the first time having a, a budget and a company that really wanted to create shoulder content around Formula One. So we had the Paddock Pass show, which actually started off as we were doing all of these interviews with the drivers over the weekend and they weren't going anywhere because we only had like a 30 minute pre-race show, all that kind of thing. So we just said, sod it, we'll just, we'll film some links. And Jason edited it together and we sent it in. And they went, what's this? And we said, well, we just, you know, we thought we'd do it, put it wherever. So they put it up on the website and it just became a thing that we did. Um, so that was great, but off the grid was a real, uh, desire by, by NBC to do something special and different. And it became a bit of a, like a travel log with a little bit of Formula One thrown in. Um, we did the road to shows, the road to Mercedes, road to Ferrari. And again, just expansive, long form content, beautifully shot, um, high end production standards on it. And, uh. And again, about, it's about taking that. So the road twos were about telling the story and about getting the fans access and into places that they hadn't been before. The off the grids were more about bringing people along for the journey, bringing them with us, bringing them into the paddocks and saying, right, we're in China. So here's where we go to have our dinner. And again, you know, it, it goes back. It just goes back to the roots of everything which is bring people along for the ride, make them a part of it so that, you know, you could be sitting on a train going to work or, you know, sitting in your office or wherever. And you could be in Melbourne 
you be in Shanghai, you could be, you know, wherever with us on the journey. And that's, that's, why, that's why you do it. NBC losing the rights was, was a bit of a surprise, um, obviously. But we, we, we'd known for a while that the negotiations were, were ongoing with, with Formula One um, about the future. Um, and it, it, the biggest shame for me personally was, was that I... Uh, I knew I would have to stop working with a, a crew that I, I loved working with and a, a bunch of people who, who were just and are just phenomenal at their job. Um, and NBC is a massive company, but it felt like this really small family. And that was, that was the biggest upset for me was that I'd lose working for them. Um, because I, lo I loved it, loved them. Um, but then I got a call from F1. And, uh, and this, this, this amazing new opportunity suddenly presented itself. You know, again, it's the strangest thing about the last 20 years is, is how just when you think things are going wrong, something amazing pops out out of nowhere. I think what Liberty realized early on is that you know, Formula One is, a, is an incredible product that maybe hadn't been um, utilized as, as strongly as it could be through a rapidly evolving um, digital space. Um, so to be on the ground as that was really starting to ramp up, it's been fascinating. It's been an eye-opener for me, massively, to see the insides of how that all works. So what we were tasked with doing was creating television, just as we had done for NBC. But rather than it going onto a cable network, it's going online. We make TV now, no differently to how we made it for NBC, but it's going, it's going online. You know, the whole, oh, you know, you can cut this corner or cut that corner. Don't worry. It's only for the web. That was never a question for us and was never a question for Liberty. It was make television, make good television. Um, and if it is good enough for TV, then it's good enough for online. And also to do things that broadcasters aren't doing because we don't want to step on broadcasters' toes. The whole point of what we're doing is to be in addition to rather than an alternative to what the broadcasters are doing. And that's really key. That's really, really important. Our job is promotion. Our job on F1 Digital is to show what's great about Formula One so that somebody who's flicking through their Instagram account or flicking through Twitter and sees something that somebody's retweeted and they're like, oh, that looks good. Twitter show is a prime example of that. So I can see how doing a post-race live show for free on Twitter might initially seem like a scary idea if you're a broadcaster. And particularly when we did our first show and Twitter were expecting 50,000 viewers because the NBA and the NFL shows get like, I think 300, 400,000 viewers, something like that. And our first show got one and a half million. So at that point it's like, oh, okay, this is quite serious. And Twitter said, okay, this is, this is bigger than we thought it was going to be. But what was good at that time is because you've got those one and a half million views, you know who those one and a half million viewers are, what accounts they follow. And so you have data that is usable. And I believe I'm right in saying that the feedback we had is that the majority of that one and a half million didn't follow an F1 account. So they had been turned on to watching it by somebody else in their timeline retweeting it that did follow the F1 account or a F1 account. Um, so you've essentially got, if half of those people, 750,000 people, aren't traditional F1 viewers, you've got new eyeball potential there. And that's what we're doing. That's what the, the growth of F1's social media footprint has all been about, is increasing eyeballs, increasing potential viewership that will then go to your traditional linear broadcasters and watch Formula One through their platforms. You know, I've been incredibly lucky that over the last 20 odd years, people have taken a chance on me. Um, 
every job I've ever been given has been a job I had no qualifications to do. Whether it was David Tremaine giving me a job as a journalist straight out of university, whether it was GP2 giving me a job as a press officer, whether it was you know, Jonathan Nicholas and Dean Locke and, and the guys over at F1 giving me a chance to be a commentator on GP2 or, you know, Fox and then NBC giving me a chance to be a pit reporter. Um, I never had any training. I never had any right to do these things. I never had any qualifications to do them other than just loving what I did and being enthusiastic, annoyingly enthusiastic, some people would say, but genuinely passionate about what I do. And I, I wouldn't still have a job and I wouldn't be here nearly 20 years later if it wasn't for those people taking a chance on me. And it's, it's amazing now to be standing here having again been given a chance to do something completely new and in a, a realm that I have very little understanding of, and I'm only just starting to understand. To be a part of a digital revolution, to be a part of the online growth of sports, you know, at a time when people get to pick and choose what they watch. And now more than ever, I think it's important to be honest and real with people. And hopefully that's why I've got this gig and hopefully it's why people will tune into what we do um, because people can sniff out bullshit really fast um, and we've never tried to sell them that you know the second you try to start to sell anything is when you start to lose all I can do is just continue to be me um, continue being honest and loving the sport as much as I do. It's done me pretty well so far. <laughs>